good morning everybody and uh, welcome to uh, part two of our autonomous vessels series. Uh, hopefully you've had a chance to uh, either take part or a uh, review of the uh, first webinar we did which was an introduction to uh, autonomous vessels uh, by our wonderful uh, Tom Howe. If not, you've still got a chance to review that on uh, the Royal Institute of Navigation's uh, YouTube channel. So uh, today we're going to be looking at the more technical aspects and I'm joined by a uh, panel of uh, three maritime experts. We have uh, Anne Pletchka, David Pollitt and Thomas Southall. So today we are going to be doing a panel. They're each going to do a short presentation on a, uh, a few technical aspects of autonomous vessels. And then we're going to open up to the floor for lots of uh, Q&A opportunities, uh, as that was, uh, that was very much a positive feature of our last uh, webinar. So, uh, yeah, please do uh, get your questions ready. What I will say, though, is we're going to be looking at uh, regulations and um, managing tra vessel traffic etc in our next webinar so if you have any questions along those lines join us for our next webinar and hopefully we'll be answer able to answer some of those so uh, introducing uh, Anne Pletchka uh, she is currently the managing director of Trinity Maritime Limited a chartered master mariner chartered marine technologist and associate fellow of the Nautical Institute She's had a successful seagoing career worldwide and then spent several further years outside of the UK holding management positions globally for maritime and oil and gas organisations. Now operating out of the Solent area and taken up the position of a chief vessel operator with Ocean Infinity and last year became the MD of Trinity Maritime, also volunteering for the maritime charity Safer Waves. We also have David Pollitt, who is currently the Capability Development Manager and Advanced Systems and Innovation Lead at OSI Maritime Systems. He is a specialist in submarine navigation, electronic navigation systems, digital charting and training, and has recently completed over 40 years in the Royal Navy. And Thomas Southall is a technical officer at IALA, responsible for managing and coordinating the technical output of IALA's various committees. Previously, he oversaw the Port of London Authority's Vessel Traffic Services, which encompassed the UK's largest and most diverse waterway, combining a high-profile city centre port as well as the coastal estuary sectors. Tom's early career included serving as a navigational officer on survey vessels in the Merchant Navy, and he's also a fellow of the Royal Institute of Navigation and younger brother of Trinity House. To start our panel off, first of all, I'm going to hand over to Tom. Thank you very much, uh, Ivana and John, and uh, hello and uh, good morning and possibly good afternoon, good evening to um, all of you who are joining us online. Um, the whole area of mass has, has created a palpable buzz over the past um, few years um, and it's it's reached a bit of a crescendo and um, Ayala realised that we really needed to understand what was going on um, in the industry. And so what we lacked, we found, was a coherent overview of, of what's going on. Now, mass has got quite a broad definition, um, which uh, I'll touch on, and I think the, the, my speakers who will follow will go into in more depth. Um, it goes from uh, better decision support tools all the way to completely autonomous unmanned um, vessels. Now, we've been speaking about this for, for, for quite a long time, um, in the in 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 the maritime industry at IMO I believe uh, I understand from a, a, an article I read in a pilot magazine that the first time it was mentioned was 1964 so this has been there's been quite an allure um to this uh, this potential of having unmanned vessels um uh, transiting across uh, our oceans and so we've revisited it again so at the 72nd session of uh, the Ayala Council, um, they decided to create a mass task force in Ayala, and their job was to look at what was going on, 
and how the marine aids to navigation um, will possibly look in the future, whether they'll change at all or how they'll develop, etc. And so the first part of that was to identify what's going on. So I'm just going to give you a very brief overview, very brief overview of, of, of exactly what we think um, is possibly um, going to happen over the next um, 20 years or so. Uh, next slide, please. So you can see um, this uh, this diagram here. This is what we've used um, to identify what's going on. Um, it does use um, the IMO's degrees of uh, autonomy, um, um, and uh, I think Anne will touch on that. Um, the, the the perhaps the the problems with this, but they used it for their scoping exercise and for our purposes, we thought it was quite useful to keep using that. We got um, degrees one and two, um, which which cover crude um, options and three and four are crewless, as you can see. Um, number one here is decision support tools, um, enhanced decision support tools to aid the mariner. Um, two and three then go into the remote options with crew and without. And then at number four, um, you've got vessels um, that are just completely um, unmanned um, proceeding on their way. Um, the, the horizontal axis here you can see um, is the time frame. And so it goes up to 20 years. So just um, briefly, if I take you down to, to here, um, to begin with, to the bottom left hand corner, you can see many crude ships with automized functions. And this to me is, is what I would call business as usual. Um, this is what the maritime world has been good at for millennia. Um, you know, if we think of Viking sunstones, Harrison's chronometer, all the way to unmanned engine rooms today, this is um, us developing better, more efficient and safer ways of operating using better decision support tool tools. Um, if we move up, um, we think um, and we can see that there are a limited number of, um, of autonomous options. You've got the Era Birkeland, for instance, in Norway, um, a small container vessel proceeding um, on, on short sea routes, and there's lots of other projects. Also, we're finding smaller ferries and survey vessels. Um, uh, 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 there's clearly a good business case for using um, autonomous um, ships for these specialised um, areas. If we move into the future, 10 to 20 years, um, we can only see, of course, um, decision support tools, better data, better, um, better connectivity, getting more and more. And also um, the same will be for those specialised um, uh, operations at sea as well. Um, but what we're not anticipating um, in, in this time frame is um, lots of large international um, voyages being conducted um, by autonomous ships. Um, there's a number of reasons for that, which I'll touch on now. Um, but principally, we engaged a, a number of shipbuilders um, uh, and they weren't particularly looking at building. They didn't have the market for, for these unmanned crewless ships at the moment. And so we, we don't envisage um, a large scale um, you know, it to be quite normal for, for, for large autonomous vessels to rock up to our ports anytime soon. But certainly a mixed picture of um, manned and some crewless vessels conducting um, smaller um, operations such as a survey, etc. But didn't seem to be an appetite for passenger vessels or tankers, um, given the riskier nature of those operations. Um, next slide, please, John. Thank you. So the drivers behind mass investment. So we're seeing um, we looked at this and uh, there were some surprises. Um, of course, economics come into it. Um, a, a good business case is always um, a draw. Um, there is uh, currently a lack of seafarers um, that I'll touch on um, shortly and uh, and 
Also, anecdotally, is always said there'll be an increase in safety of navigation. So if I just briefly touch on the economics, um, which is really something that's always cited um, about mass operations that, that, that it will lead to savings um, for the shippers. Um, it wasn't quite as clear cut as that uh, when we looked into it. Um, if you have um, crew on board, then normally um, a small part of the overheads for shippers. Um, if you have remote operations, for instance, um, then quite possibly you'll have crew on board and crew ashore, plus a lot of infrastructure also that you have to um, that you'll have to build and maintain. Um, and with the infrastructure, with the remote operations, the pull is, of course, to have um, more space for cargo. You don't need accommodation. You don't need um, space for, for, for navigational purposes. Um, so therefore, um, that would be the pull. But we, we're not actually seeing that happen. Maintenance as well is conducted currently at sea. And unless we uh, anticipate making our ships out of something different, they'll always need to be maintained. And whether the shippers will want to do that when they're alongside, I doubt very much um, because it will incur cost and, um, and time um, alongside. But the lack of seafarers did come out um, when we were discussing um, this at a recent workshop um, we had in Ayala headquarters. Um, currently, we've got about 26,000 um, uh, STCW qualified um, officers short. Um, there is a big shortfall. And so shippers are interested in how they're going to man their, their, their vessels in the future. And so this could be quite a, a neat alternative for them. So it's not necessarily the economics, but it's it's perhaps necessity. Um, and of course, if you're working ashore, it perhaps be a better, um, a more attractive um, option to working at sea also. Safety of nav is also um, mentioned um, quite often. And saf safety of navigation, the focus there is on the removal of the human element. Um, the, um, enhanced decision support tools, autonomous um, ships are said to be more reliable. They don't have fatigue. They don't get uh, as confused. Um, and so therefore the argument goes that they're much safer. However, of course, um, uh, the, the tools are susceptible to other threats and other risks, cyber security, et cetera, um, being one of them. And if you don't have a human involved, you don't have the human um, there to assess what's actually going on and perhaps come up with some creative problem solving um, to uh, remedy the situation. So again, I don't think it's as um, clear cut as all of that. To do mass properly, you need um, reliable connectivity, which I, I seem to have at the moment. No one's shouting at me at the, mo at the at this time. I've got two boys, so they're both on holiday and they've promised not to go on the internet now. And so they've given me all the bandwidth. So fingers crossed, I've got reliable con connectivity as well. Um, resilient PNT is also um, going to be an area um, that's going to continue. Um, but the benefits of uh, of 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 mass that I see are not necessarily related to having uncrewed um, vessels. They're actually um, more to do with uh, the decision support tools um, being enhanced, which perhaps will give us a, more of a degree of precision, optimized routes, perhaps efficient transit times, resource utilization, um, most importantly and perhaps a reduction in um, congestion. So, and all that comes from um, better connectivity, better sh ships with better connectivity, and therefore better data exchange and what we can do with them. And with that, I will hand now over to Anne, who will um, expand on those themes. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you, thank you, Tom. And yeah, good day to wherever you all are in the world. Um, I'm going to start with a little bit of a memory from 
<clears throat> sorry, a memory from both my own career and where I am now, really. So um, I do actually remember the days, all right, they were not in black and white, but I remember the days where I joined my first ship and there was a decker on board and I firmly remember having to learn about Lorand and all, all the good old navigation methods that, well, we used then and thankfully a lot of which I still use today. Um, at the same time, uh, I've spent the last few years involved with remotely operated ships and control centers like the one you see on the right there. So we are definitely in the age of remote control. Um, but what I always like to think is a lot of it is based on the same sound principles of navigation and primarily how we fix our position, how we avoid hitting things, whether they be navigational hazards of of underwater objects, surface objects, other ships. So the principles have to be the same. And obviously, to, to me, that's always been maritime safety, which is how I actually got into this in the first place. I, I wanted to make sure that maritime safety was at the heart of this. Um, as Tom said, that it, mar autonomous ships became quite a buzz a few years ago, and I realized I didn't know much about it. So uh, I, I came in as a bit of a skeptic, I will admit. Um, next slide, please. So over the over the last few years, I've actually realized that a lot of this is not new, um, as was just said as well, that we have had an evolution of automation, both in my lifetime and also the lifetime of, of my father, who was at sea before me, uh, where we've we've seen the invention of radar moving into ARPA, and now where you can quite often see automatic ARP acquisition, uh, we see the same obviously with maneuvering, we see the same with position fixing where I was on a vessel only last week where paper charts were our primary means for navigation. However, we also had an ECDIS and I can assure you it is much easier coming into a port that is quite poorly lit with some not brilliant atoms um, when you have an ECDIS showing you a live position of where you are um, to confirm your paper chart at the back of the bridge that's a little bit more difficult and time consuming. So uh, and, and Radio Watch for sure was a, a massive change in terms of automation, uh, replacing radio officers uh, with GMDSS. So a lot of what we are doing with autonomous ships, and as Tom said, with the likes of decision support and automation is not new. How we will continue to evolve and use it going forward is perhaps the newer part of what actually is happening today. Uh, next slide. So the way I, I tend to see it is that there's, there's a whole ecosystem around how we approach autonomous shipping. There is an awful lot of questions of why. Why are we doing what we're doing? There is a lot of getting away from the cool shiny bits. There's a lot of cool technology. There's a lot of really impressive things that can be done, but I often like coming back to the, why is it being done? So for me, we need to have the right design. You have to start with the right design and having the right sensors and the right technology also is not enough if we don't have the correct procedures, the correct training, the correct regulatory landscape for that to operate in. And of course, as Tom touched on, the business case to do it. There's a lot of things we can do, um, but there's a lot more to an autonomous ship than just the end result, whether that's a fully autonomous ship sailing around um, algorithm based or whether that's remote control of a vessel or, as, as Tom just mentioned, that vessels that can have some seafarers on board and some supporting from a remote control center. So. To me, the, the very center of this bullseye of this circle for me is why. And then from that comes having appropriate design and tech and procedures and everything that underpins what we do with autonomous shipping. Um, next slide. Um, so as was mentioned, the IMO did create these four degrees of autonomy in their regulatory scoping exercise. Uh, they are now quite well known. Um, they have been used an awful lot in the last few years and what we've found as we've gone through the years with this is autonomy's got a lot of different meanings to different people 
And if we take, for example, steering a vessel, which is one of the absolute basics of navigation, you, with the IMO definitions, which are on the screen, screen here, you can actually argue that an autopilot or a track pilot, which is a piece of equipment that we've had on board vessels for years and years, could actually be considered mass degree one. It is an automated process because it steers the ship. It is a decision support tool because it, it will give you an alarm when the vessel goes off course. It's unsupervised. A seafarer doesn't watch the autopilot performance constantly. And it, there is a seafarer ready to take control. If the autopilot isn't performing or there's critical operations, such as you're in confined waters, you're approaching a port, you're approaching an oil rig, you go into manual steering. That's the procedure. So in terms of an autopilot, it could be considered degree one, which could therefore mean that the majority of commercial vessels out there today are on mass degree one, which I don't believe was the initial intention, obviously, of the the scoping exercise, although I obviously am not IMO. So the good news is there's been a lot of evolution since then. And as you can see from the pictures at the bottom of this slide, uh, there are examples here of essentially an example of each degree. So we have the Nelly Bly who, who sailed around Denmark with seafarers on board. We have a Drix USV that regularly plies the ocean for multiple different ship owners um, doing unmanned surveys and then the, the Mayflower that crossed the Atlantic. So there are existing cases of all four of these degrees of autonomy. However, the terms can be confusing. Uh, next slide. So we've seen that change is needed and IMO also see that change is needed for these terms. And there's a few reasons for this. One of the cons first considerations is that the autonomy levels are much more complicated than where the seafarer actually is based, but it's more how they interact with the seafarer, the sensors, and how they control the vessel to start with. So if you have a seafarer on board, they can be in control, they can be able to intervene, or they can be a backup and not able to intervene, uh, or, or be immediate, not immediately able to intervene, sorry. So if we go back to that steering example that I just used, if you have a, a seafarer on a cruise ship, they can be in control, they can be on the helm in, in manual steering, or they can be available, they can be on the bridge, but using an autopilot, so they're not in manual steering, or they can be in backup, they can be in a cabin waiting for an alarm to go off. So in all those situations, the helmsman is on board, but there's very different risk profiles. So this idea of whether the seafarer is on board or not on board doesn't necessarily fit 100% um, in terms of, of seafaring degrees of autonomy. So in a nutshell, the needs of a vessel on the mass scale very much depends on where the human needs to be, where the human is, and what that level of human interaction is. Uh, next slide. So there has been a little bit of progress made in the last few years on this. ISO created uh, this, this standard uh, probably about 18 months ago from memory now. It's probably longer ago than I think it is um, for autonomous ship system vocabulary. So as we can see from the slide, they, there's various terms that they've put forward, such as operator exclusive, which again, in our example, would be a manual steering. Um, operator and automation, which is this blend of an operator and technology, which would be an autopilot. There's autonomous control, which we have for vessels that have dynamic positioning. If you're following a route or you're following a sub, for example, an ROV, that could be autonomous control. And then there's fully autonomous, um, which we could see from the example previously with Mayflower, where you have AI algorithms controlling the navigation of that ship. Uh, they also have a lot of other terms, and you can read the ISO standard. Um, there's, it's a purely a standard on vocabulary. Uh, and there's terms such as the difference between uncrewed and unmanned, which is um, slightly nuanced. And again, we'll see how this works in practice. Um, and the question really is, do these terms suitably deal with categorizing mass as we are seeing them evolve in practice? Uh, next slide. So if we just take this ISO terminology and with, with the, those, those terms that we looked at before, 
a ship can still have crew on board, but have autonomous control. We have thousands of DP vessels around the world regularly doing follow sub maneuvers, fully crewed, um, but having autonomous control. And whether people would consider autonomous control to be a ship with seafarers fully crewing as per a minimum safe manning, I'm not so sure. Uh, we can have a ship with absolutely no crew be completely unmanned, but not have autonomous control at all. And we see quite a lot of examples out there of uh, remotely controlled ships um, that are controlled from seafarers that are not on the ship at all. Um, and then you can have no humans on board and be unmanned or have no crew on board and be uncrewed because of this nuanced definition between the two. So, again, I, I find it's one of these these situations that was with the best intentions, hopefully trying to clarify, but maybe isn't particularly clear. Um, next slide. So going into the what remote and autonomous ships are briefly with with navigation, because obviously that's a lot of what all of us here on the webinar are particularly interested in. There's there's no one particular setup for an autonomous ship. There is no particular autonomous ship. And it again, it comes back to the use case. Where do you want to use this ship? So I think it was explored in the last webinar as well that various technologies combine to create a system of systems. And the ones here on the screen are some of the common sensors that can be found. There are plenty of others. And a lot of these are quite familiar to us on conventional ships. And for all intents and purposes, in many cases, the benefits are the same. I mean, if we're talking about a vessel that is remotely controlled by a seafarer in a remote control center, a lot of the information they need is the same as if they were on the ship. However, there are also sensors that are needed to enhance their situational awareness. For example, cameras having to replace being able to look out of the window um, is, is one example. So there, it's a case of designing your system of systems relating to where you're wanting to operate. How congested are your waters? What are the marine users you're expecting to navigate around? What is the job you're expecting to do on the, on the vessel? Um, is it, a, is it a, an area where LIDAR could help you? Um, so it's combining and integrating all those different systems together. Uh, next slide. So a little bit more about these, these use cases, because um, I'm, I'm quite keen on the fact that as to that initial wheel that I put up a few slides ago, we have to design autonomous ships with the correct technology to make them as efficient as, and as safe as possible. So what's the topography like? A forward-looking sonar is going to be much more useful on a vessel that's coming in and out of ports that um, have much more need for an accurate echo sounder um, that forward looks. It's, are you expecting to be in day, day, not, day operations only? Um, is it an area where you're expecting a lot of restricted visibility, in which case the quality of your cameras and infrared could be a lot more important? Um, one I always like to consider is that a simple misdirected or rather quite a precision strike from a seagull bow movement can really ruin your lookout capability. If you don't have a good camera washing system and you have a seagull with a particularly good aim, suddenly you can eff effectively knock out your bridge windows in one strike. So having a camera wash system as well as a good camera is vital. So it, it's not just the actual sensors, but it's also the system around those sensors. Uh, and the amount of machine learning you want to, to put in. I mean, the, the picture on the, the top right there is um, from Zellin, who, who used machine learning and computer imagery to identify if there are uh, people in the water and then able to go search and rescue and automatically deploy a vessel to go rescue a person in the water. So there are excellent use cases for some advanced technologies. Um, Integration with S100 and 200, we will hear more about that. And uh, again, very, very important. Um, but throughout all of this, we also must be cognizant of the fact that technology is brilliant, but if we are remotely operating a ship with a seafarer and a human in the loop, we must avoid sensory overload and clutter. Uh, we can have a lot of good information coming in, but if we just have a human dealing with it, it can be too much. We could also have garbage in, garbage out. And the picture on the bottom right is a real live picture 
that was sent through by a pilot down in Australia of an augmented navigation system where the AIS input was incorrect. So the the picture of the vessel on the AR system is clearly not where the vessel is situated. And of course, that, that can cause significant confusion. So uh, a lot of different considerations and certainly no right or wrong answer. Uh, it's also about the infrastructure behind these autonomous ships. It's all very well having an autonomous ship with a remote center, but you have to think, as we're saying about the connectivity, what is the redundancy? What's the availability of, can you have a mesh network? Do you have redundancy in your remote operation center? Because the last thing you want is somebody to dig up the road outside your remote control center and knock out the internet shore site. Um, what network engineer support do you have? Um, how do you ensure PNT resilience? And we'll hear more from David on that in a, in a few minutes time. Uh, next slide. Uh, just a quick one as well about auditory inputs. Um, onboard vessels, we take in a lot of information automatically. Uh, we have an awful lot of, of audio inputs coming into our, our brains. Um, there are various different use cases. Ivana, being a pilot, I'm sure can confirm how many of these different scenarios for audio inputs really do play a part in day-to-day -day life. And if we try and imagine a seafarer in a remote control center with a headset or with speakers trying to process all these different audio inputs, how we manage that is a particular challenge that we don't necessarily have, or we have in a slightly different way on vessels as we do in, in a remote setting. So again, it's it's how we deal with this system of systems, with the human integration with, with the technology and not just what the technology can do for us. Uh, next one. And finally, um, there's there's the regulatory aspect. And I know this will be covered a little bit more in the next webinar, but it is a consideration for the technical aspects of mass, what are fitted to mass, and uh, also, I think to some extent, the amount that shipbuilders, as Tom mentioned, and also technology manufacturers are, are prepared to develop, because where you don't have performance standards and where it's there's not a clear pathway you can end up putting a lot of investment into something that that may end up being misdirected and there's there's hesitancy there so thankfully we are now at a stage where most major class societies do have rules or guidance um there are notations in some respects both on on class side and on flags some flags even have notations uh, for autonomous shipping so and there are there are some wider standards. We were talking about how it's not just about the ship, and some class societies do, for example, have uh, guidance to do with ISM and how ISM can interact with an autonomous ship, and also how training and competence standards for remote operators. So it's there's very much it it's the whole of the ecosystem, and definitely not just the ship. Um, we have the IMO that have been very actively looking at this. There is a draft mass code currently being worked on, and it does look look on course to be in force next year in a voluntary capacity and mandatory in 2028. And I think that should help then produce a lot more of a framework to work to for, for all stakeholders involved. Um, one area that we are thankfully quite advanced on in some respects is guidance for resilient positioning, which is obviously crucial for autonomous ships. And with that is a very nice pass over to David. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, moving on to the uh, autonomous navigation system solution, whatever the, we would like to call it. Uh, my first port of call uh, for this was uh, what I call the uh, the Royal Institute of Navigation UK PNT Advisory Group uh, white paper, or uh, as I would prefer to call it, a position paper. Um, it gives the definitions for resilient PNT, uh, which we've we've talked uh, talked about in the previous um, uh, presentations. Um, it covers th that particular bit, which is the ability to return quickly to a previous good condition after problems have occurred. Um, robust PNT. Yeah, yeah, strong and unlikely to fail. Assured PNT, certain to be achieved or maintained. Um, and I think from that, you can understand why resilient is the one that we, we tend to look at most because 
it allows for failure, it allows for a certain amount of risk and, and uh, loss of uh, capability for a period of time. But beyond that, there are alternative systems available and some of those we've seen in the slides uh, already, so we'll cover a few as we go through. But the main piece I look at is how do we fuse that data? How do we utilize that data within the machine? Um, and how do we uh, predict future path calculation to allow that resilience um, to continue when I don't have a source of PNT? I'm now relying on the traditional DR and EP. And within you know, an ECDIS or any other uh, navigation system, that is something that is already calculated. So it's not a new feature within you know, computing and, and positioning. What are the tolerance levels that are going to be allowed by the class society? by the, uh, the insurers, by the cargo uh, um, sub, uh, yeah, uh, users. Uh, and what is the risk versus cost uh, that we're going to be uh, putting ourselves into by putting this vessel in a particular place? What's the quality of data in the voyage area? Uh, yeah, if we're gonna run this vessel through a particular area, and I'm not just talking about the, the bathymetry and the survey information, although that is, is vital to what we're trying to avoid, what about radio navigation uh, reception? Uh, are these notorious uh, areas for uh, jamming, spoofing, those sorts of things? And you know, is there a conflict going on? Do we want to be transmitting uh, certain signals in these areas? So those are things which we need to uh, very much have in the balance as we start to build the autonomous navigation solution. Next slide, please. We've had a lot of talk about the levels of autonomy. I'm not going to cover those, but it's I boil it down to what is being decided by whom and where. Is it the computer on board? Is it the person on board? Is it the person offshore? What's the information? And out of that comes the next bit, which is what communications have I got? What fallback have I got? Uh, how much information am I trying to pass down this, this pipe? And as, as Tom said, if suddenly somebody's on the Xbox in his house, we're going to lose we're going to lose his picture. Uh, is that crucial at this particular moment? No, but when I get to the end of my presentation, I've got to hand back to him. So I'd rather like to know that in a couple of minutes' time, he's still got that connectivity. Um, positional information. Uh, there are a diversity of sources: uh, GNSS, um, Leo Correction Services, uh, VDES coming through, and other capabilities being considered as, as part of this package. You know, how do I bring all of those together? Is that off board, on board, edge computing? Time. I think time is the most crucial element of PNT. I always have done. Uh, and it's the one that is you know, typically the easiest to, uh, to manage as long as you've got a GNSS signal on board. However, that is not the, the only solution. And also, how do I synchronize across a network? If I'm talking to a remote operations center, are we talking the time, same time zone? I don't mean time zone as in you know, Zulu to you know, X-ray. I'm talking about the, the same time functionality to the number of microseconds or even, even greater um, that we need to have for us to be able to manage the information that's coming through and how we make those decisions. Um, navigation situation awareness, oversight, you know, how much information are we having to pass back to that remote operator for sound, for vision, and for the decision making that goes on. And then finally, weather and routing. Yeah. We're all seeing the, the, the great increase in you know, voyage optimization for a number of very good reasons. So we're talking about routing. We need to be able to pass that route to the vessel. We need to have real real-time feedback. Is is the prediction what's actually happening in the area? And then we need to look at what are the codes that are out there. The Australians, uh, UK have got codes of practice for autonomous um, uh, for mass uh, already out there. The IMO are working on theirs, you know, and section uh, you know, chapter three, section one, is dealing with navigation in mass. Um, it's not there yet. It's still in the in the discussion and draft phases, uh, and is getting input from a lot of places. We need to be cognizant of what is going on, but in the meantime, certain nations have produced their own codes. 
which will then go to the class associate uh, class societies and uh, and come through to the shipbuilders. So we need to understand where that's going. Next slide, please. Navigating safely. Um, yeah, we define the route plan. Is it berth to berth? Is that shared via S421 as we, we come into the S100 series uh, of products? Uh, is it a, is it a shared RTZ file that uh, you know currently works within uh, with current Exis and uh, S57? Does the level of autonomy factor in pilotage? Yeah, are we going pilot point to pilot point and then handing over to a pilot who will conduct on board or off board uh, you know, remote pilotage? Is that another form of uh, remote control that will come through? Route following. What is the accuracy required you know, in open ocean, coastal and harbour approach? Many of the systems that we see uh, specify a, you know, an accuracy in all three of plus or minus 10 metres or even greater um, because they are reading the figures that they get from GNSS. Is that a valid figure for a certain part of uh, the water? Uh, you know, do you need 10 metre accuracy in the deep ocean? Or do you need that 10 meter accuracy once you get into coastal waters and then better accuracy as you get into the harbor approaches? So those need to be considered. The chart data, we, we talk about machine, machine learning, machine reading, um, you know, the chart data for autonomy. Uh, UKHO uh, working on the S100, I know, because we're working with them on this. Um, that data is you know, beyond S100 in terms of what is required for the autonomous vehicle, for the computer to be able to read it. Uh, and I've just given one example there, the future chart concept at the University of New Hampshire, and uh, we'll share a link on that later if people want to, uh, to look it up, um, where you're talking about machine readable databases that take us beyond the stage of just what is in the S100 product. And uh, the, the pictures there are shown an example. This is an S57 chart. Uh, entering Plymouth Harbour at the breakwater. On the breakwater, there's a very, very nice light. Yeah, machine readable, machine vision would be able to detect that very easily. But looking at Maker Point Light um, down at the bottom there, um, which is the would be a headmark for a, a a ship conducting pilotage going in there. A bit more difficult to pick out from what's around it. Um, and I, I could have chosen several different examples of where that might be a problem. So, yeah, bringing in cameras, LIDAR, radar, as already discussed, but also depth sounders and forward-looking sonar. They are yeah, machine-readable information that needs to be translated and then read against charted information, but bathymetric information. And as already said, situation awareness and collision avoidance, the visual lookout, sound reception, interpolation. How do we interpolate what we're seeing? And I haven't even done the, uh, the nighttime uh, the nighttime view of uh, what pilotage looks like and how the, you know, using a, a, a head mark, which is a light, and getting the right uh, light pattern at night. But there are information available on that. Next slide, please. Cybersecurity, um, yeah, sources of information. Every source of information is, is separate to that. Um, the US. Department of Transport has declared that interference in GPS is a cybersecurity risk. The latest statement come out there and needs to be considered as part of the industry cyber plan. Same goes for the Marathon. Uh, they, he was talking about it for communications and, and shore-based activity and for the civil aviation, uh, federal aviation authorities, it is, is for the US. But it needs to be considered as a cybersecurity risk to the platform. What other external sources am I using for you know, getting information? Uh, yeah, you know, there's a, a very nice picture of a Loran aerial there. Um, they still exist, just, um, and uh, more and more um, countries are looking at having that as an alternative source of uh, a radio nav system. Uh, having personally used it, I think it's great. Um, can't carry the, that uh, particular clock from the uh, from the tower in Prague, but uh, you know. What is your source of timing? Yeah, Loran again provides a, a, a source of timing. Other other sources are available in local waters, uh, and you know the uh, the RNAV and uh, VDES capabilities coming through uh, with GLA and others will offer those sorts of functionalities uh, going forward. 
how do we counter GNSS uh, yeah, spoofing and jamming? Is that part of our, our, our plan as part of our, our risk assessment and delivery of equipment onto the platform that allows us to take forward a safe navigation plan with resilience such that we can recover once the, uh, the, the jamming or spoofing is uh, yeah, defeated or has terminated. Um, what's our plan? And I'm not talking about the route plan, I'm talking about our navigation safety plan. What happens if I lose all sources of navigation, internally or externally? How do I know, I've, uh, uh, first of all, how do I know if I've got a problem? Yeah, what's the, uh, uh, what's the navigation sensor system error budget? How do I detect that I've lost this capability? Uh, yeah, the alerts that are coming up. What are my mitigation plans on board? What's my decision-making tree, the what if? Do I hold position? Do I continue to DR and, uh, and EP on until I recover? What's the timeframes that are available? Have I still got communications? How do I recover from that failure? Is that an automatic process? You know, or is it the, the good old fashioned control alt delete yeah, and uh, restart the computer? Yeah, uh, we, we do that an awful lot on current active systems. Uh, and uh, you know, at least there's a person there to, to do that. If we haven't got a crew, that's got again, be part of the remote. Next slide, please. Alternatives. I've mentioned Eloran, um, but there are other ways of, uh, of navigating. We used a lot of them already uh, in the, uh, the manned uh, crewed uh, vessel. Um, visual fixing, a line of position from a, a, a recognized point. Again, yeah, very nice lighthouse, probably very easy to pick up in a camera. Can I see it? Can I identify it? Can I track it? The same problem as you would have for the crew the officer watch recognizing that light positioning it on the uh, the appropriate chart and determining that that's what it is but if you have a camera that is able to continuously track it and pass that bearing to your system you're now providing a continuous equivalent of you know radar uh, bearing information to your uh, plot line of position can i use radar techniques you know blind pilotage techniques parallel indices yeah, they are very very good in terms of uh, you know, being able to see where you are for an off the watch, the same runs for a computer. You can drive the autopilot uh, using that information, maintaining yourself uh, within the parallel indices on the points that have been de detected. But again, you've got to be able to, in inverted commas, see it, identify it, and then track it as, as part of that picture. And the last one I put on there is what we call bottom contour fixing. It's using the uh, bathymetric contours uh, and running a, a running fix to validate your position uncertainty. If you're running an estimated position, uh, it will degrade with time. If you've got an inertial navigation system, it will degrade with time. How do you maintain that if you haven't got GNSS? Uh, and these are three techniques. You know, radar and visual tend to be very useful in coastal waters and obviously in the approaches to harbors. In the open ocean, it may be that some form of contour fixing may be the, the, uh, the feature, but what's the quality of data you've got? But then again, if the water is deep and you haven't got very much information, is there a risk in the next half hour or so? You know, we used to have a you know, policy for how often you put a line of position on the charts. Uh, how, how often do you plot an alternative position on a paper chart, uh, depending on how far you are away from land or from danger? And it's that assessment that needs to be considered as how do we then maintain that DREP and position uncertainty. Uh, and with that, I'll hand back to Tom, who's going to talk about the future. Thank you very much, David. Um, really enjoyed that. Um, now, um, the future was a that's a that's a term that I've heard ever since I started in uh, in in maritime, and particularly when I joined. Ayala, the future, future VTS, future this, future that. And uh, quite frankly, I'm not very keen on hearing it anymore because it's always just been a bit of a placeholder for things that don't tend to happen. Um, so what I want to focus on now is, is things that are quite tangible, things that, that, that can happen and perhaps are happening. Um, 
looking um, just here um, at the emerging trends, technology and practices that I, you, you can um, see, it's all a bit jumbled up, but you can see mass um, digital tech and comms, um, there's the concept of just-in-time arrival, DST, um, decision support um, tools and services, they're all connected, okay? They're, these aren't islands, they're, they're all very, very um, related to each other. And basically, what they're about is sharing data and doing more with it. Um, so having a better connectivity between shore ship, um, between ships, um, and 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 understanding what's going on much better, having better situational awareness um, in the immediate and for the and for planning and and us doing much more with that. And I think mass basically helps all of this along. Um, the ships are going to get better um, connected, and as we've said all the way through, um, they're going to have better decision support tools. Um, next slide, please, John. So I'm focusing really on the side effects um, of, of, of mass, and, and this is certainly um, one of them. Um, this is, uh, I'm, not, I'm a bit of a layman with this, um, with the new digitalization efforts that we're doing, but this is a, a slide that I quite like. It, it's a good overview of actually what our work entails at the moment. We're taking information, collecting it, validating it through um, initiatives like the MCP, the Maritime Connectivity Platform, and then using S100, um, which uh, Anne touched on earlier, um, IHO's S100, and we're integrating that data and presenting it better to the user. Um, we've got our own little world called S200, which we'll cut to um, in the next slide. Um, but once we've got all that data, collected it, validated it, integrated it, then we move on to how we going to exchange it with the vessels um, and with Shoreside. And, and there you've got some examples of exactly what we're doing. Um, VDES, for instance, um, is one that's been really pushed um, within the committees at IALA. Um, and then we have all this data and we can analyse it. We can use um, AI perhaps and, and different tools to make better use of it so that we, we, we're, we're making gains operationally. We're being more, uh, more efficient, much more safe. Um, next slide, please, John. I promised to show you the S200 world. This is increasingly my world. Um, and uh, and all the different sources of the inf of information in um, marine aids to navigation are there. Um, VTS, um, you know, uh, connectivity with boys um, to the vessels, et cetera, et cetera. And so it's all about grabbing all this data, integrating it and 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 giving it better portrayal so that it's of some use um, to the end user. Um, next slide, please, uh, John. Thank you. Um, and just to pick on this, I'm not particularly endorsing um, just-in-time uh, arrival efforts, but I have to say it's it's one of the, the areas that have really tweaked my interest. And that's because if we go back to what I was saying at the beginning, I can see it's a win-win for, for most of the parties involved. Um, particularly, there's a business case for, for some ship owners. So just-in-time arrival is all about speed optimization. It's about um, uh, contact and sharing data ship to shore and with the, um, with the ship owners to make sure that the vessel can come straight in and doesn't uh, go to anchor, doesn't wait. Um, and can be um, completely um, ready for her arrival when she comes in. And I like this because um, it will make better use of resources, potentially save uh, an awful lot of fuel, um, which makes um, us happy in terms of uh, emissions. And also it makes the ship owner happy in terms of it saves them some cash. So the, that's the kind of thing that I can see uh, uh, easier wins for us as we progress 
um, areas where there, there is a business case, it's going to keep everybody happy, it's going to be better for the environment. And that is basically all about um, sharing better um, data um, between us. There's examples of this in Tangier Med. The harbour master there was very happy telling me all about um, the Kobe Express uh, that come in in 2021. Um, and they're, they're, they're just in time arrival. Um, and there's also projects in Finland. Um, it's perhaps, you know, you can pick these things apart. It's perhaps better for major shipping lines um, and uh, that, that know where they're going. Um, and perhaps less so for the Baltiski 7001, who doesn't know where they're going, which port they're going to next and could be diverted at any moment. But nonetheless, there's something in these efforts um, I'm, I'm pretty sure. So um, next slide, please, John. And just just to finish off, um, this is um, this is the River Colne. This is where I live. It's quite a nice little picture um, there. This is Wivenhoe. Um, regardless of whether vessels are uncrewed or as as and as I've learned today, or even un unmanned, which apparently are different things. So uh, it's uh, it's always evolving this terminology. Um, the side effects of this project with mass are, are, are pretty great you know we've been talking about efforts to make better connectivity reliable connectivity resilient pnt um, making ourselves more resilient against threats cyber attacks making us more efficient better use use of resources so regardless of whether there's actually human beings on board or not, all the efforts that are going into this mass effort, I do believe will will, will kick out some some transformative um, stuff. It could be that VTS is the front of house um, for um, the port um, for for the coastal states, um, but nonetheless, it's going to be a transition. And as I said, it, this is over a long period. You know, we're talking up to 25 years at least that we'll have a mixed um, mixed picture of very different vessels uh, navigating and doing uh, different roles. And we have to remember there's differing capabilities. So not all our ports are the ports of Rotterdam, Singapore, um, for instance. Um, we have lots of different types of ports, lots of different budgets that currently are trying to do um, what they're required to do now, let alone um, get into the digital game and uh, and and start receiving mass vessels. And also, as we touched on, the owners of the Baltiski 7001 will have uh, very different views uh, to that of Maersk on investment in infrastructure, etc. So we have to remember this is a transition and we have to cater for all shapes and sizes and from our point of view you know we will be providing traditional aids to navigation for the foreseeable however that i'm sure that there will be developments there and of course um skills will have to change also but whatever happens uh, I, I i always like to think we must think of the end user which currently and will be for a long, long time, um, the end user will be the mariner. And so we have to keep that in mind. And uh, and all of these efforts for, for mass, which can mean from uh, decision support tools to, to nobody on board, um, I think it's all good stuff for the future. So I'm really optimistic um, that all these efforts um, to, to, to create better connectivity, better data sharing, um, will not go to waste and will really improve the future of navigation. So with that, thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Tom and, and uh, David. So we'll now open for some uh, questions to our panel. Uh, so if you'd like to, uh, to write in your questions, uh, do you start doing that? You can direct them just to open or to one of our individual panellists. I have one to start with. Um, I think, uh, Tom, I'll ask you, uh, can you explain a bit more about what machine readable data actually is and why it's so important for the future of these new technological systems? 
Yeah, sure. Thanks, um, Ivana. Um, yeah. So as we were talking about um, onboard decision support tools developing, um, and uh, I think David had some uh, great examples of, uh, and, and I think Anne did as well, um, of of uh, of different views from the vessel in terms of decision support tools using cameras, etc., to see what's around them. Um, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about those decision support tools, perhaps interacting with uh, traditional voyage. And probably the easiest um, way to um, to display that is we're all very familiar now with QR codes. Um, uh, you know, we've all been through the pandemic, used it for our restaurants, etc. Well, it's just an identifier, basically. And so that machine can then read what it's looking at and then do something with it and perhaps we can the boy will pass information the other way it will tell it what it is where it is etc etc um so in a very basic sense that that's what it is and it's important that we are on top of these things to make sure that these dsts um uh, can can do their their job as well i know that grad um, uh, in the UK, um, work with the, uh, the, the the general lighthouse authorities um, are looking into this at uh, this at this moment. But um, yeah, very exciting um, stuff with that. Excellent. Thank you very much. I think we've got a question online already. Uh, we do from Rob, and the question is: How do we ensure we have resilient and low latency ship to shore, short ship, high bandwidth? Quite demanding, uh, Rob. Data communications for degree of autonomy two, three, and four vessels offshore. So, how, how do we ensure we've got resilient data comms? Anybody want to take that one? I can chip in and say a little bit here. Um, and I think it partly depends on how offshore we're, we're counting offshore. Um, I think there are some excellent examples in. Um, so-called offshore, no, so-called offshore sort of oil and gas and renewable fields, um, where they've been putting mesh, very reliable, robust mesh networks, whether that's on wind turbines, whether that's on fixed platforms, um, to provide very, very robust local networks uh, for vessels in those fields. So you can rely on, um, for example, low Earth orbit or geostationary satellites um, or 5G LTE. Um, which can also be placed offshore. You can have balloons, um, for example, as well. There's so many different connectivity methods, and it primarily depends on the infrastructure that there is offshore. Obviously, the middle of the Atlantic offshore is going to be very difficult, different to middle of the North Sea offshore. Uh, but certainly, I think there's a lot of merit in terms of internal mesh type networks for certain applications. Um, there are Pros and cons with with low Earth orbiting and geostationary satellite comms, as we know, um, services such as Starlink are starting to really revolutionise connectivity. But uh, there has to be that guaranteed bandwidth and link um, to enable that resilience, which can be a barrier. Uh, but obviously, the, the the availability of these services is is evolving all the time. So uh, that's certainly my my take on it. That uh, Yes, there's a lot of advances in satellite communications offshore, but there's also a lot more range in terms of terrestrial and also airborne in terms of, um, for example, balloons, um, but also, uh, yeah, mesh networks. Great, thank you. Dave, do you want to comment on that one? Yeah, I'd agree uh, with those comments. I, th I think it's a case of having redundancy uh, and also thinking your your risk appetite in certain waters. Uh, the closer you get to to uh, to land, uh, the more likely you are to have alternate means of uh, communications available. So that is good. Um, assurance, you know, have you paid your bill with Starlink to ensure they continue to supply the uh, the, the the pipe work that, that uh, delivers your data? Are they going to suddenly cut you off? Uh, yeah, Ukraine has found that one to their their uh, uh, detriment, um, and. Is it resilient in terms of um, cybersecurity? Those are the questions you need to ask and then determine, you know, if I'm in the middle of the Atlantic, do I need instantaneous comms all the time or do I need to assure I've got you know, 
a, a communications window which is available to me when I really need it. Um, those those are the, the problems you try and resolve. Okay, thank you. And, and linked to that, uh, what happens if connectivity is lost? So their procedures all agreed up front. And what sort of record keeping, log keeping uh, would you advise? Yeah, so um, it's the what if plan. Have I got communications? If I lose them, what do I do while I'm regaining them? Has the vessel you know, recognized that it has lost communications? It's lost the handshake. Um, does it then go into a holding pattern or does it continue with the mission uh, until such time as communications are, are restored? How long does it keep going? It's then a navigation safety problem as well as a, you know, it's, it's the speed times distance uh, element. Um, record keeping. Uh, yeah, how much are you keeping on board uh, and how much are you uh, storing ashore? Um, the likelihood is everything that comes from the vessel is being stored ashore for the period of the voyage. What is being stored on, on the platform? Again, dependence on, on the voyage type and the mission and the risk appetite from your insurers. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. they, may have a, they may have a saying on uh, what goes into the VDR. I would uh, also add in here that it's it's a bit of an unusual concept, but it, it we're moving towards a sort of minimum safe manning requirement for unmanned ships in a bizarre sort of way. And I'll expand on that a little bit insofar as some of your crucial manning for unmanned ships of the future is likely to be, and is already in some instances being proven to be network engineers, connectivity engineers who are monitoring those ping rates, the uptime, that can start to notice a degradation in connectivity before it becomes a critical issue and swap over onto different systems. Um, and certainly I know from, from the work that I've been doing, it's there's an importance, and again, this comes back to the wheel I, I showed in one of my slides of, of training and procedures in terms of having contingency drills for suspected interference, suspected loss of connectivity, uh, whether, that's um, a, a vessel that's that's crewed with decision support, whether it's uncrewed and it's got a remote support ashore or whether it's a, a fully unmanned ship and you're relying on that heartbeat. What happens when that heartbeat is lost or that connectivity starts to degrade even? Um, how, how that is dealt with is, again, very similar to what we do with traditional ships. It is yet another emergency and contingency situation that we need to plan for we need to have procedures we need to have drills and we need to have both technology and perhaps even manning in terms of of connectivity engineers um to help resolve and ensure that as much resilience as possible great thank you and there's a question here from simon which um, in essence is, should should all of this innovation be left to the market or should there be government intervention and investment in R&D capability, for example? Any comments on that? Well, um, yeah, I can see uh, in, in Simon's um, comments, he's talking about the UK government and um, far be it for me to uh, comment on uh, the UK, um, but coming from a, an international um, organization or soon to be an international organization, um, I can say that there is a healthy mix of 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 private um, enterprise and government support all the way all over the world, um, particularly countries like uh, Korea, um, Singapore, etc. are very interested in, in these developments. Um, the Netherlands as well, and you can see all the different projects that are springing up all over the world, um, particularly with mass, but with all the other different um, uh, elements that we discussed um, as well. Um, and I do know that if you look on our website, there is a uh, list of all the projects, all the mass projects um, uh, that we're aware of um, uh, are, are there. If you have a look under the, if you can find it on the website, it's a bit of a rabbit warren, but um, uh, under the mass um, topic. So uh, there's a healthy mix. Um, and uh, grads uh, in the UK are doing a great job. Brilliant. Thank you, Tom. Um, we've got a question here from John um, about the different mass levels and if legislation is going to move towards um, enforcement zones 
um, especially in the busy ports or high volume shipping lanes. Um, I would encourage you to join the next webinar where we're definitely going to be talking about vessel traffic uh, between uh, manned ships, unmanned uh, crewed or non-crewed vessels. Um, brings us nicely on to uh, what we'll be covering in that third webinar sometime in uh, April or May. Um, and we're going to get some, uh, some very interesting speakers to talk to us a bit more uh, about sort of what regulation is moving towards. Um, so do, do join us then. Um, I am also aware that the IMO is hosting a uh, panel discussion on the 11th of April, uh, specifically about uh, autonomous vessels and traffic management in ports. Um, so yeah, that's so another one to tune into. We're going to keep you hooked. <laughs> Do we have any more questions coming through? Uh, yep, there is one about Ilaran actually, which is if if the government, uh, well, if Ilaran infrastructure existed today, uh, how long would it take for that to find its way onto ships? What's the sort of process for that in the renewal times? And are we talking about a few years or a few decades, for example? Are there any comments on that? Yeah, I'll take a, a quick uh, punt at that one. Um, uh, there was a, a a number of companies who had produced Elaran receivers um, just in time for the uh, Elaran networks to go down. Um, how quickly would they recover? Um, the EU has a uh, a, a funding uh, package out uh, for companies to produce Elaran receivers, um, so that, that's a, an entertaining one. Uh, I think. Um, the technology is available uh, and could be fairly quickly uh, reinst reinstated in certain receivers. It would probably be almost a case of you know, your GNSS receiver would also have an ELRAN channel um, as, as part of it. As one solution I've seen from a, uh, a, a former Dutch company. Um, and uh, it's really then down to how quickly can you get the towers rebuilt all the, the facilities available. Thank you, David. So we're going to start wrapping it up there then. Um, so I, I do find it fascinating. Thank you so much again to our panelists uh, today for uh, tackling some really challenging and difficult topics, some very much, you know, forward thinking, trying to look into the future to see what, what might be what might be next on the horizon. I think we're beyond the dawn of uh, mass and autonomous vessels. The sun's certainly rising on, on this one. Um, but certainly the sense I'm getting from, from all of you today is that the developments in these technologies are certainly going to be an aid and a tool um, in improving efficiency, improving safety, reducing risk, and all these things will really be useful for the mariner as, it, as they are now on manned vessels and for uh, vessel traffic services and, uh, and will be for some time. So uh, this is very much a watch this space and we'll, uh, we'll hopefully keep digging into more of what this might look like. Do join us for the next webinar. As I said, we'll be digging into what those regulations are at the moment, how they might be uh, moving, and what the future of traffic management might look like, and uh, maritime spatial planning, looking at autonomous vessels and uh, areas where we see both manned and unmanned vessels, and those uh, are our friendly leisure users in their jet and the, <laughs> and the kayaks and the challenges they might pose as well. So I uh, thank you very much again to all our panellists. Thank you for joining us today and for your insightful questions and we'll see you next time. <laughs>